You are listening to the end of year Telegraph Cycling Podcast presented by Trainer Road with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney and Daniel Freib as well as Ned Bolting, Rob Hatch, Ola Shinawi, François Tomaso and Chiro Scania Milieu. Hello, my name is Richard Moore, and this final cycling podcast of 2015 is a bit different, since the three regular hosts, myself, Lionel Burney, and Daniel Freib, will be joined, virtually at least, by some of our regular guests, Ned Bolting, Rob Hatch, Orla Shinoui, Francois Tomazo, and Chiro Scognomilio, as we each select our heroes, our villains, and our moments of the cycling year. The clips you're about to hear were recorded in a variety of settings, in conversation in a pub, in Lionel's bedroom, Francois's sick bay, while Chiro, no doubt, was on the beach. You will hear from us again at the end with Lionel's very important Christmas message. Please listen to that if you're interested in listening to and supporting the Cycling Podcast in 2016. You will also hear who won our recent competition to win a signed copy of Bradley Wiggins' book, My Hour. But without further ado, let's kick things off with Ned. Over to you, Ned. Who's your hero of the year? Well, I, I thought of a few. Um, I guess some of these will be nabbed by your fellow uh, contributors as well. So I'll try and uh, get in first, basically, and nab them. I was going to go Lizzie Armitstead at first. That was my initial reaction because what a year she's had. And then I kind of remembered straight away when I think of Lizzie's year, you think of the Rainbow Bands and that great win in Richmond, um, as well as coming off the back a couple of weeks before of of sealing the, the World Cup as well for the second successive year. And then you think back to June and that cataclysmic accident she had in the women's tour where she went over her handlebars. And honestly, I was stood just a couple of metres away from her as she lay on the tarmac and was treated by the paramedics and pumped full of morphine, I think, really, because she was in a great deal of pain. And it looked at first glance life-threatening, genuinely life-threatening. And at second glance, uh, it looked career-ending. And at third glance, when, you know, it looked, well, she'll be lucky if she gets away with, you know, the rest of her season here. It looks season ending. Ultimately, she actually wanted to start the next day. It was an extraordinary turn of events. But to come back from all that and have the season that she's had, she's, uh, you know, now she's talking about the, um, the gold medal in Rio, which would be um, hard, I think, given the parkour, but that would be summit thing if she could pull that off. But I haven't gone with Lizzie. I haven't gone with Lizzie. So you'd have to cut all that out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she told that story without mentioning Mick Bennett. Yeah, well she, she <laughs> Mick was actually more seriously hurt than her. Thought he'd broken his arm, bless him. R- uh, race director Mick Bennett. No, I haven't gone with Mick Bennett either. I've gone with um, John Dagenkolb because it's funny, isn't it? How that because the season sort of marches on and achievements silt up over further achievements. Just because the races he won were right back in the spring of last year, it almost seems forgotten. But to have won Milan San Remo and then Paris Roubaix. And I went, as I often do, just out of interest, I went over to Roubaix and sat in the velodrome and watched. I don't think it was a vintage Paris Roubaix this year. You know, it had that kind of interesting factor of Bradley Wiggins giving it, you know, his honourable contribution, Wiggins. But it was, you know, when that big group came into the velodrome, it was just a total foregone conclusion that Dagan Cole would win. And um, and he executed it perfectly again. And I think, you know, that's, that's a rare breed of rider who can do that. Those two races... You know, at any given point over the length of a career, but in the same season, that's remarkable. Hats off to him. Hats off to him then again for two other, you know, less less remarked upon um, contributions to the cycling story this year. One was in the Vuelta, where he didn't have a great time. Finally, got his stage win on the on the final day, but prior to that, had been slavishly and quite brilliantly working for Tom Dumoulin's surprise GC. Um, effort and in fact was often the last domestique standing in that giant Alpacine team um, working for Dumoulin on the climbs and for a rider like Dagenkolb I thought that was breathtaking actually and, and really said something about the ethos within that wonderful team really looking forward to seeing them next year that was the one thing so that was great what a, what a heroic ride that was from Dagenkolb but also a little and some of you will have heard this story but plenty haven't a little side story about Dagenkolb was that after Matt Rendell our colleague, journalistic colleague, pulled off that stunt with Laurent Jalabert, challenging him about his own doping past and, you know, to substantiate the claims he was making about Chris Froome during the Tour de France this year. And that kind of went a bit viral and Chris Froome retweeted it, etc. The following day, Dagenkolb, who doesn't know Matt Rendell, 
just at the end of whatever stage it was, rode past him, recognised him from the TV clip, turned round and rode back to him and said, are you Matt Rendell? And Matt said, yes. And he said, uh, just wanted to thank you very much for challenging Jalabert, you know, on behalf of most of the, you know, the peloton and the younger riders, the younger generation. Um, we need more people like you doing that kind of thing. Which um, was very nice of him. You know, if I was Matt Rendell, I'd have been extremely flattered by that. But also I thought, spoke volumes about Dagen Kolb's um, intelligence, actually, and let alone his propriety. Orla Shinoui. For my hero of the year, I'm going to be a little bit naughty, or should I say greedy, or probably both. Um, it is the season to be naughty and greedy, so I'm going to go for two heroes of the year, and they are the Road World Champions, Peter Sagan and Lizzie Armitstead. Sagan, first of all, because just the swagger that he brings to the sport, and I'm so glad that he's going to be riding in the Rainbow Jersey next year. What a fantastic World Championship race, and I hope that that swagger, that confidence, that arrogance, that cockiness, that really just gets annoying after a while, but um, that he has shown in such abundance just a few years ago will be back in evidence in 2016 there was a fear I think or for me anyway that despite his great um, green jersey multiple green jerseys at the Tour de France that a little bit of that cockiness had gone by the wayside all his second place finishes at the Tour maybe robbed him of that arrogance that you need really to be able to do what he has done with such aplomb but for such a talented all round rider I think he's every right to be as as confident and um, as brash and over the top as he is so and I think we saw a little bit of that back didn't we with the the leather jacket to the cycling gala I mean <laughs> that was a bit ridiculous but it's just brilliant it's just quite cool and hopefully podium girls everywhere will be a little bit safer now that he's settled down and got married because I hope we will be seeing him at the top of the podium a little bit more in 2016 and then for my joint hero Lizzie Armitstead because she's just a brilliant champion and I'm so glad to see her as well in the rainbow jersey I've been championing her for quite a number of years and I think obviously her talent has been clear for everyone to see but the confidence that she's grown in the last couple of years on and off the bike is just marvellous to see and I think she's a great ambassador for the sport in a sport that is often dominated by hyperbole and extravagant emotion dare I say when it comes to just how far the sport should have moved on by now I think that Lizzie brings quite a bit of common sense to the debate. Lionel Burney I've got two heroes of the year the first is Simon Geschke of the giant Alpecin team who won stage 17 I think it was of the Tour de France at Pralou in the Alps they got in the big break and then got in a much smaller break and then got in a solo break and won the stage in quite emotional fashion. He was in tears in the post-race interview. You could tell how much it meant to him. And, you know, he really rescued the tour for Giant because they had been without Marcel Kittel, Tom de Moulin had crashed out early, John Degen Kolb had come up short, and uh, they really needed a stage win, and, and the days were ticking away. But more than that, it wasn't just the fact the way he won with a good old-fashioned solo break it wasn't the fact that he showed that emotion at the end which um, demonstrated just how much it meant to him but really it for being the first fully bearded Tour de France stage winner for as long as I can remember in fact if you're listening and you can remember the last fully bearded Tour de France stage winner uh, please tweet us at cycling underscore podcast the fact that he looked like one of the Russian baddies from the film American Flyers didn't detract one bit from the heroics of that day. So hero of the year, Simon Geschke. But I'd also like to mention multiple heroes of the year, everybody, all our listeners, every single one of them. Now, this is a shameless attempt to earn some undeserved popularity for myself, but without our listeners, we wouldn't be producing this podcast. And it's been very gratifying to see our audience grow over the year and reach brand new heights during the Tour de France. But I'd particularly like to um, say thank you to everyone who's been so kind when coming up to us at races and saying hello, telling us how much they like the podcast, giving us feedback, of, you know, good, bad and indifferent. But in particular, the group of Welsh fans who took a Where Are We Lionel banner to the Alps 
fantastic. I mean, people did come up to me and ask whether I'd paid somebody to do that. I hadn't. And that's not me saying that I'm prepared to pay somebody to do that either, just in case anyone's getting ideas. Um, I'm not paying for a personal fan club to follow us around France next year. Um, but that really was uh, quite a moment. The only disappointment for me was I didn't actually see the banner with my own eyes. I only saw it on Twitter. I heard rumours of the banner a day or two earlier. Then I saw some pictures on Twitter. So next year, let me know what mountain you're going to be on and we'll come and say hello. Daniel Freib. I'm going to say purely on the basis of, well, a couple of days in the Tour de France, Thibaut Pino, who got the yips again on the descent off the Col d'Alos, had a bit of a Lionel Blair, fell off on the way down. On his way to well, what looked like being a stage victory, you know, there was the potential there for him to have a complete meltdown again, as he had in 2013 because of his descending in the Pyrenees. He had a very bad descent in the Port de Payer, completely fell apart. There was the potential for that trauma to start haunting him again and for his whole Tour de France to completely fizzle out at that point because it wasn't going well at all, his Tour de France. And um, was it the next day or two days later, picked himself up, got in a break. He got in numerous breaks, actually, in that final week and really showed a lot of character to win the stage into where, Richwood? Uh, no, it wasn't. Oh, yeah, Alpduez. Alpduez. I was thinking because he was also in a break on stage to saint jean de Maurienne, wasn't he? But won the stage to Alpduez, a fantastic finale, a fantastic grandstand finish to the Tour de France, supplied by Thibaut Pino. Rob Hatch. OK, Rob. Hero of the year. Telefini. I'm sure we can all remember the stories going around. Not many of them, thankfully, broadcast. But this guy's never going to ride again, people were saying. Awful injury. Everybody was feeling really sorry for him, quite rightfully so. He worked so hard. He came back and he won that brilliant stage on the otherwise uneventful USA Pro Challenge. Great to see him back, working hard. And again, you know, the guy's not even really a sprinter and he won a sprint, so it was, it was even more remarkable by the way he came back. Ciro Scognamilio. My hero of the year, this will be a, really a surprise for you, dear listeners, is not Pippo Pozzato or Daniel Friede, better known as the king of the zoo of Berlin now, but Oscar Gatto. And Oscar has to share the title with his manager, Moreno Nicoletti. And now, my explication... It's a season with Androni, the team of the Prince Gianni Savio, has been in a world awful. He only arrived a few times in the top five to victory in Romani, but nevertheless, he has found a contract with the team called Saxo, one of the best teams in the world and will be an important domestic for Peter Sagan, champion of the world. So, what can I say more? Chapeau Oscar and Chapeau Moreno. Heroes of the year. Richard Moore. My hero of 2015, Ciro Scognamilio. A lot of people have asked if Ciro, our Italian friend on Gazzetta della Sport, is real. I think they think it's Daniel doing an impression. Well, I must confess, to use one of his favourite expressions, that Ciro is not only real, but he is more real than most. Yes, he is eccentric and unorthodox, but it's not an act. That is Ciro. He is gloriously authentic. When you see Chiro at the tour or any bike race, you can't help but smile. He's always beavering away. He's always in a hurry, usually on the phone. If he's not on the phone, he appears to be quite literally sniffing out stories, hurrying along, slightly stooped, following his nose, often running, in fact, as video evidence proves from this year's Tour de France. Because for all that Chiro says that cycling isn't even in his top 10 favourite things, he is actually a very good journalist. He knows everything that is going on, as well as lots of things that are not actually going on. If gossip is the stock and trade of the journalist, Chiro is the maestro. One of the most pleasing things about the podcast has been the way that so many of you have taken Chiro to their heart, which shows to me that so many of you are very good judges of character, because trust me, in my opinion, Chiro is the real deal. This is François Tomaso picking his villain and hero of the year in cycling and his uh, cycling moment of uh, 2015. Excuse my <clears throat> sniffing a little bit because I have flu. Anyway, my um, hero of the year was undoubtedly Tom Dumoulin. I really, really loved what Tom Dumoulin did in the Welta. I think it was absolutely amazing after his crash on the Tour de France. The guy is young, he's brilliant, he's, he's 
probably one of the very best time travel specialists in the world and now he can climb. He's nice, he's pleasant, he's clever, he's good looking. I mean, he's really, really good for the future of the sport. I think, well, he looks clean. So uh, no, to me, Tom Dumoulin is really uh, a rider to watch and a very, very exciting young man. So uh, this is for my hero of the year. My villain, oddly enough, is Chris Froome. I say uh, oddly enough because I was probably the only French journalist to defend uh, Chris uh, during the Tour de France after uh, the allegations of uh, doping and everything. And I still, you know, defend him because I think there was not the slightest hint of a proof that uh, he'd done anything wrong. Still, I found the whole of the Team Sky and Chris in particular during the Vuelta a little bit paranoid about, uh, you know, the problems they, they, they say they, they've had from the fans and everything. There were times when the uh, Team Sky bus looked more and more like Fort Knox and looked more and more like the Armstrong bus in the bad days. So I think, you know, Chris has always been a great champion because in the same time, he was tremendous and humble. And I think he's lost a little bit of his humility. And even Dave Bracefield seems from time to time to have lost his knack for talking to the press and be pleasant. And so it's more a matter of uh, public relation than uh, really uh, value. But Team Sky, I think, should really clean their act, uh, you know, PR wise. So uh, Chris, I'm sorry, but uh, you're my villain of the year. As for my cycling feat of the year, for me, the most uh, important moment of the season was probably the World Championship and Peter Sagan uh, victory. Because, I mean, Sagan has been a leading actor of, you know, all year round. He was, you know, in on the Tour de France, you know, finishing second so many times and being active and present almost every day. The, the man is not my favorite uh, rider from time to time. He can also be a little bit of a nuisance. But what an exciting rider and the way he won the, the World Championship was simply amazing. So great, great champion, great feat. Best wishes for the end of the year and uh, season greetings, as you say. Bye. So your villain of the year, Ned... Well, I was going to go with Laurent Jalabert because it seemed easy, but he's been, look, towards the end of July, he had the look of a man who'd been punched in the face. He, he had a, you know, I think he realised what, can I say the word tit? What a, yeah, I, what a tit he'd made of himself on the telly. And I think he knew, he knew what a fool he'd made of himself. And, and I, so I'm not going to punch him anymore. He's done that to himself, punched himself in the face. So we'll leave Jalabert alone. And instead, I'm going to go for the moto pilot who on the Vuelta decided to attempt an assassination on Peter Sagan and, um, uh, you know, resulting in those famous shots of Sagan giving him volleys of abuse and then punching the roof of a car, not slapping it or anything, literally, because he's Peter Sagan, punching the roof of a car made out of metal and then riding off swearing at another motor pilot who'd had the temerity to ride up alongside him and get shots of his arse hanging out of his shorts and, um, you know, but he was on, he was bang on form, Sagan, and was teed up to have a fantastic Vuelta and, and not only that, he was going to wear the, the green jersey all the way to Madrid and, you know, collect that massive prize of €4,000 that you get if you win the green jersey that ASO put up for their leading athletes to collect. But it was all denied him by this reckless... Um, it was a neutral service motorbike in the end, wasn't it, I think? Yeah, you're nodding, but I, I, I think it was. And, um, but whether it was his fault or he was called through by some incompetent race director or commissaire, I don't know. But uh, it, was a, it was a hopelessly unnecessary bad bit of driving that could have been actually seriously much more serious for Peter Sagan because let's not forget he dusted himself down got back on and became the world champion just a few weeks later Orla Shinoui I've gone for a bit of a pantomime villain um, for 2015 and forgive me if this is a bit British centric but my villain is the mayor of London Boris Johnson for that fiasco during the summer whereby he came out and said that yeah we could have had the Grand Depart in 2017 but you know what we don't want it because it's going to cost too much money for the London taxpayer and it's not value for money. Well I'm sorry Mr Johnson you've been in power for quite a while and I think you've got a fair grasp of the economics of all of this um, you would have known exactly how much money it was going to cost to bring the event to London and I fear that he was using the sport of cycling as a little bit of a political tool and to me that makes 
possibly him the political tool if that's not going too far and the reason that that is annoying is because that if Christian Prudhomme was going to give the Grande Par to London there are several fantastic candidates that could have maybe gotten in there instead and I hope that that will now be the case and London may be overlooked the next couple of times or certainly the next time it tries but if we could have a Grande Par in for example Edinburgh or Cardiff imagine bringing the tour to Scotland or Wales I think that would be amazing in, in getting kids there there, excited about seeing the event right up close because those of us who work in cycling can easily forget just how exciting it is and how much it really brings a boost to an area and gets children into sport and that is just fantastic and I think that would happen much better in Scotland or Wales than it would do in London which is a bit overrun quite frankly with international sports events and I deliberately didn't mention Northern Ireland because I know that all of Ireland are sort of staying away from the Tour de France for the next couple of years and, and focusing on other um, bringing other races to the island but for that reason Boris Johnson is a typical pantomime villain in that we get to have a little bit of a laugh at him but hopefully he'll do some good in the end by diverting um, attention to to somewhere where the Tour de France would be a little bit more worthy and welcome. Lionel Burney. Villain of the year. Well, this is too easy and too obvious, but it is pantomime season after all, so it's also no contest. My villain of the year is Oleg, don't call me an oligarch, Tinkoff, because he's the walking embodiment of the phrase, more money than sense. Now, this is supposed to be a jokey end of season review, but it has to be said there's a really serious charge sheet building against Tinkoff that can't be ignored just because he's got all the credibility of the world's worst Bond villain. Come to think of it, calling him a Bond villain gives him too much credit because Bond villains plot to dominate the world with some genius but implausible plan. Tinkoff is more like a pantomime villain, more likely to trip over his own comedy trousers than devise a clear strategy for the sport. In fact, if he does follow through on his promise to pull out of cycling at the end of 2016, look out for him next Christmas playing King Rat in Dick Whittington at the Basingstoke Playhouse and put me down for two tickets. We're as much to blame as anyone for giving Tinkoff this platform to spout his stuff because it is ear-catching, it is newsworthy of thoughts. But if the media reported only what Tinkoff did rather than what he said, he'd barely get any coverage at all. He's just a giant hot air machine, the Donald Trump of cycling he's been called in recent days. And he's becoming the go-to guy when it comes to working out what the future of professional cycling looks like. But rather than being a visionary, what we've got here is Bernie Eccleston with a wave set and blow dry. And his manifesto for the future seems to be no more sophisticated than a desire to generate more money for himself. And he's also got a surprisingly squeaky voice. So here's my villain of the year, Oleg Tinkoff, and for two reasons. The first is that when it comes to the Giro or the Tour, he wants to ride the stage route ahead of the race. And that's all fine. He's a very rich man. He's on his glorified holidays. He's paying for the whole shebang of the Tinkoff Saxo team. The jersey's got his name, the name of his business on it. It all belongs to him. But spare a thought for the poor staff member who has to drive a team car behind him all day. And the second reason is for saddling his team with a jersey that looked like the sort of thing that a group of lads on a stag do would wear to go paintballing. Case closed. Daniel Freib. Villain of the year, Simon Clark. Simon Clark for callously, calculatingly lending his wheel to Richie Port on stage 10 in the Giro d'Italia to Forlì, meaning that Port would incur a two-minute penalty for accepting assistance from someone who wasn't on his team thereby causing Port's Giro d'Italia challenge to run aground and fail catastrophically the knock-on effect of which was Port's market value going down because he was negotiating with Sky still at the time I think he ended up going to BMC I think that the collateral effect of this was Clark's market value going up as an Australian with, you know, maybe the potential to do something on general classification in the future. So I think it was all a cunning, calculated, premeditated ruse by Simon Clark against the fellow countryman. Rob Hatch. The TV director or whoever was responsible for the absolute debacle that was the classic of San Sebastian. We didn't see anything. I know that Adam Yates won. We were trying to commentate on it on the day. We weren't there on the day. We were actually in the studio, so it made it all the more difficult to know what was going on. We sort of saw and heard about this motorbike crash. We still really don't know what happened to this day, but apparently the plane had to land because of an emergency, but we didn't see any more images until the last, what, 200 metres? Not even Adam Yates knew he'd won at the time. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, did it make a sound? It's a bit like that, isn't it? 
It's one of them ones, isn't it? <laughs> Chiro Scognamilio. My villain of the year is by far Pippo Pozzato, and this should be a big surprise for you, the listeners, but I have a clear explanation, and I will convince you for sure. It's not for his bad season, not at all, and nothing concerning Pippo could be bad, but for me, it's already arrived at the time for Pippo to change his life. He would have already done it. Pippo is not a cyclist, and he has to live as soon as possible. The bike and the cycling world too small for him because he's ready to become an Hollywood star, cinema, theater, and more. I'm sure of this. So my mission is now to convince him. And in the meantime, he's no more than a villain. Richard Moore. My villain is Oleg Tinkoff, the colorful, flamboyant owner of what in 2016 will be known simply as the Tinkoff team, led by Alberto Contador, and Peter Sagan. It'll be Tinkoff's last year. Oleg has said he'll be off at the end of 2016, and I'd like to think he won't be missed. In fact, I'd like to think that the fact that he's going, essentially because he hasn't got his own way, is some kind of advertisement for the sport of cycling, and an endorsement of its values and moral code. Okay, maybe I'm getting carried away. But Tinkoff can be offensive, rude, charmless. You'd think that somebody as successful as him in business would be charming, but he's not. He's only interested in what he has to say. To illustrate how interested Oleg is in the opinions of others, do you know how many people he follows on Twitter? One, Tinkoff Bank. He came to our Cycling Writers Christmas dinner last year, berated one of our colleagues for an article he'd written in front of everybody. Then, and I sat beside him, beside a ringside seat, he treated us to a monologue for the next couple of hours. He showed not a scintilla of interest in anything anyone else had to say. Tinkoff has symbolised the worrying trend in the last few years, which has been cycling's increasing reliance on a few billionaires who run teams. I'm sure Tinkoff has some good ideas for restructuring the sport, but equally, I'm glad he can't just rock up, demand change and get his own way. So on the one hand, it's sad that a sponsor will disappear, and Tinkoff has certainly given us lots to talk about. He's colourful and he could be funny as well as offensive. But really, in the final analysis, I think cycling can and should do better than Oleg Tinkoff. You are listening to the end of your Telegraph Cycling Podcast, presented by Trainer Road. And Ned, what's your when you think back over the cycling year, what's probably your debut in the commentary box, but what, what's the story that Well, apologies, there may be people listening to this who might have been to one or two of the live events I've done over the autumn who will have heard this story. On the Ned tour. Yeah, because uh, I've cracked it out a few times. But it's interesting, I think you might have even heard it, so you, you just have to pretend to look interested while I rehearse it again. But that happened on the Tour de France, and it was the day that, um, what was it, stage four, stage five, something like that, when Tony Martin was in yellow, and he crashed. And in that crash, it seemed like all the GC favourites minus Chris Froome, managed to come down as well, one way or the other. They all kind of like fell on top of each other. And somehow Froome kind of negotiated his way past it and rode up unscathed on that final climb. Anyway, Vincenzo Nibali thought that Froome had caused the accident. Then this series of kind of like, and this is how the Tour de France works. The reason this story is interesting is because this is the kind of rumour-filled echo chamber that we all operate in, that some ma- misfires occasionally. And this is a good example of it misfiring. So anyway, Nibali throws a water bottle at Chris Froome. Now, I didn't see it. Did you see it? No, lo- loads of people didn't see it. In fact, I don't think there's any video footage of it, but it happened. And at which point Dave Brailsford, who got wind of it happening or had seen it happen himself, I don't know, um, let it be known to Matt Rendell, who works as part of the ITV team, that Nibali had thrown a water bottle at Chris Froome and that Chris Froome had subsequently stormed the Astana team bus and had words with Vincenzo Nibali, which is an unlikely thing, but it happened. At which point, even though Dave Brailsford had told Matt Rendell this kind of off the record and just to keep for himself, Matt being Matt came back and blurted it out to absolutely everyone. God, so you'll never guess what happened. Nibali threw a water bottle at Chris Froome. At which point, oh, did he? OK, well, that will explain why he went on the uh, Starner team. But, oh, that, right, that explains that bit, right? So I thought, well, I was just hanging around waiting to record a podcast or something equally useless like that. So I thought, well, I'll just fill a bit of empty airtime here by um, tweeting what happened. So I said, if those of you wondering why Chris Froome went and had words with Nibali, it's because Nibali threw a water bottle out of him. Send, post, tweeted that, right? Minutes later, I get a, um, a text message from Chris Froome saying, who said anything about a water bottle, Ned? I don't know. That's quite serious, isn't it? The leader of the Tour de France, the Chris Froome, is, is, is texting me about this. And he's obviously checked Twitter. 
so I ring him, not expecting to get through. He picks up his phone straight away, and I said, well, Chris, did, was there no water bottle? He said, no, no, there wasn't a water bottle. I don't know where you got that from. And I said, well, between you and me, Dave brailsford has been telling everyone that, you know. He goes, no, no, Ned, there wasn't a water bottle. I went, okay, well, I'll, did you get on the standard team bus? And still, yeah, no, that happened, he said. But I was just, you know, just wanted to make a few points, didn't you, Billy? But that's fine, that's all put to bed, and he, he's apologised. And But there was no water bottle. I said, well, I'll, I'll gladly correct that, and I'm sorry if that's got you into trouble. So I tweeted, I thought, how am I going to tweet? Tweeted a correction, so just to clarify matters, <laughs> I now am led to believe that there was no water bottle thrown. I hope that clarifies it. Anyway, but I posted that and get another text message from Chris Froome saying, thanks, mate. And then I get another text message from Chris Froome saying, there was a water bottle. <laughs> Orla Shinawi. For my moment of the year... I think it's something that's off the bike, but I think it's something that's very important for what it says about the sport, and that is Oleg Tinkoff deciding to withdraw his money from cycling. The sport obviously has existed long before um, individuals with a lot of money have come into the sport, or whoever those individuals are, and it will survive beyond someone like Tinkoff leaving. But it's a bit of an indictment, I think, as to where the finances and the business structure of cycling are at the moment, because we talk an awful lot about the change that it's needed in cycling but um, one of the most difficult things to get right clearly is this overall overarching structure of sponsorship of um, financial security and that's what underpins the sport um, Tinkoff for whatever one thinks of what he's had to say actually has spoken a lot of sense in the last couple of years and he's he's spoken as someone from outside the sport and I think that's really refreshing so when he talked about for example riders going for all three grand tours many uh, raised their eyes and tutted and had a little bit of a giggle but then we had the likes of city of Brailsford and Jonathan Walters coming in and saying actually that might not be a bad idea it would give a little bit of structure to the season we would have to massively rethink um, what that season would be and so the purists won't be sad to see Tinkoff go but I think that what it leaves behind unfortunately is a sport where still instead of bringing in fresh exciting external business experience people who know how to run businesses we're left with with an awful lot of people who um, maybe wouldn't be able to earn their livings elsewhere and who wouldn't be able to get a job elsewhere. And that uh, that's the um, the people who were involved in cycling in the dark old days um, and are still there and are still at the very top of the sport. So for me, the departure of Oleg Tinkoff um, isn't so much a moment of the year because of his individual departure, but because of what it says about the state of cycling's finances and business structure as a whole. So that's my sum up of the year. And if I can be so bold, I'd like to just wish a very, very happy holiday to all of the Cycling Podcast family. It's been a brilliant 2015. I hope you all have a lovely time celebrating the end of the year and into a very exciting, hopefully, 2016. Best season's wishes. And here's to a fantastic new year. Daniel Freib. Story of the year, well, it's a moment. The best moment of cycling of the year was Peter Sagan's descent off La Roquette, the Col de Mans going into Gap in the Tour de France. Didn't win the stage. It was at Ruben Plaza, was away. It was a bit of a tactical cock-up, actually, from Sagan. He really should have won that stage. He should have played his cars better on the ascent of the Col de Mans. However, the descent itself was white-knuckle roller coaster, toboggan ride, fantastic action. And it really brought back into my mind what David Miller had said to us on the podcast last year about Peter Sagan being like nothing professional cycling has seen before like and a real sort of extreme sportsman he you know he combines the daring and the agility of a snowboard or a BMX or a rock climber whatever and that was the most gripping exciting moment of cycling of the whole year in my opinion Rob Hatch John Nenko my moment of the season I think uh, we're in the commentary box with Sean Kelly I remember a few weeks before being at Paris-Nice, John Degenkolb coming up to Sean Kelly, asking for a bit of advice, talking to him, great to meet you. And it turns out that the great Sean Kelly is the now great John Degenkolb's hero. John Degenkolb winning Paris-Roubaix and uh, milan San Remo at the same time, just like Sean Kelly did back in the day. First man to do it since then. At the end of the broadcast, I put it to Sean that, you know, he's won that rather well, and Sean said, well, you know... He's done it better than me. And I thought that was a lovely end to a brilliant day and it just encapsulated the, the brilliant, humble nature of Sean Kelly, the broadcaster now after the great champion. Chiro Scognamilio. 
my favorite story of the year is an image. Yes, an image. The stage is London outside Olympic Velodrome, 7th of June, 9 p.m. more or less. Bradley Wiggins has done the World Hour record and also the press conference is already finished. So at the end, he wears an whole historical cycling jersey. Molteni jersey, yes, the Eddie Merckx team, and he stops for a lot of time outside the velodrome to sign autographs and more. A champion has spread the history of cycling. I mean, world our record, Molteni, Merckx, kindness, love for the public, a great story after an astonishing record for our marvelous sport. My story or moment of the year... Forgive me the indulgence, but I was in the Basque Country in September doing some interviews, and while there I was inspired to produce a podcast about the region's cycling culture. I met up with Haimar Zubeldia and Markel Ididar of Trek Factory Racing, and Mikel Landa of Astana headed for Team Sky in 2016. None of them would let me buy them coffee, which was most unusual, and they were all happy, away from the pressure of racing and training, to chat about their home, what it means to them, and why they think cycling is woven so deeply into the fabric of life in the Basque Country. What resulted, I hope, was something a bit different, something that we want to do more of next year, broadening our own horizons as well as those of our listeners. Once the podcast was released, I got an email from a listener, Colin Buchanan, who I think put it best. It's very impressive, Colin wrote, how confidently those riders were able to express themselves and describe really quite nuanced aspects of their background and regional identity in English. Become a friend of the Cycling Podcast 2016 for just £10. See thecyclingpodcast.com for details on how to become a friend. Before we bring the curtain down on 2015, we have a competition winner to announce. We interviewed Bradley Wiggins a couple of weeks ago and ran a competition to win a signed copy of his new book, My Hour. Thanks very much for all your entries, but the winner picked at random is Jane Cavendish. No relation, we don't think. Jane, please get in touch by email or Twitter and we'll arrange delivery of your prize. Thank you very much, everybody, for entering and well done, Jane, for winning. It's been a great year for the Cycling Podcast, but we couldn't have done it without the help of a brilliant, committed and enthusiastic team who have helped us with production, editing, sponsorship, design, technical support, and lots of other things too. In no particular order, we wish to thank Paul Scoynes, John Mooney, Alexandra Aidey, Tom Wally, Jonathan Rowe, Nigel Brown, Paul Shafto, Greg Trauman, Simon Gill, and our sponsors, British Eurosport, Van Dessel Cycles, Jaguar, and Trainer Road, and our media partners, The Telegraph. Also for allowing us to use their fantastic music, 13 Senses and Glass Pear. And thanks very much to Intelligent Mobile for their technical support. Have a very enjoyable festive period. We'll be back in the new year. All that remains is for our Christmas message or our festive message from Lionel Burney. Over to Lionel. Hello and welcome to the Cycling Podcast Christmas Message. I'm Lionel Burney. I've had a couple of sherries, so bear with me, but this very short podcast is just because we'd like to wish all our listeners a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and also thank everyone for their support and feedback in 2015. It's been our best year yet. We've broadcast from the centre of the Roubaix Velodrome, the top of Alpe d'Huez and plenty of places in between. We've interviewed some of the biggest names in the sport and brought the genius of Chiro to a bigger audience. Hello everyone, listeners. We produce more than 70 regular episodes. We launch Kilometre Zero to take you behind the scenes at the Tour de France. We launch Friends of the Podcast, giving 11 in-depth episodes for people who signed up to support us. And in July, during the tour, we hit 100,000 downloads in a single day for the first time, which catapulted us towards the top of the iTunes chart. It's not just Richard, Daniel and me that puts the podcast together. There's a whole team behind us. From our group of extremely talented producers, a photographer, graphic designer, web guru and people who help us run the cycling podcast as a business. But without the listeners, we would not have a podcast. Without the financial support of those of you who signed up to become a friend of the podcast this year, we would not have been able to produce those 70 free episodes. Now we're committed to keeping the regular episodes free to air so that the largest number of people possible can continue to enjoy it. 
Sponsorship goes some way towards covering the cost, but it's not enough, and so we rely on you to support us by signing up to be a friend of the podcast. It was a bit of an experiment this year. We knew we didn't want to ask for money without providing something in return, and so we committed to producing these 11 extra shows, knowing there was a possibility only a small number would sign up. Fortunately, the response was great, and your patience while we experienced technical problems was much appreciated. The money we've generated this year has enabled us to deliver on our promise to make the special episodes downloadable on mobile devices, which we know a lot of people wanted. We've got some great plans for the 2016 Friends of the Podcast specials, and we hope you'll sign up to enjoy them. You can become a friend of the podcast and receive exclusive shows throughout 2016 for just £10. See thecyclingpodcast.com. In the meantime, Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year from Richard, Daniel and me, and see you in 2016. Thank you for listening throughout 2015. We hope you will join us again in 2016. For now, a joyeux Noël et une bonne année from everyone at the Cycling Podcast.